Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. I'm in the moment. I'm going to knock her out. Oh, Lord. Ooh. Who's looking for a suddenly prayer? A sudden presence, a sudden change, a sudden shift in the atmosphere. He has been steadily working, and he comes suddenly. Don't worry about how long you think he's taking, because as you know, or should know, it's his timing that is perfect. His timing is better than your timing that you could ever think, ask, or imagine. And when when it comes, and it comes suddenly. Exceedingly abundant. Mm. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Father, thank you for this time to worship you. You are here and we invite you to come in even more. Come in like a flood, like a fire. Refine us. Take us deeper, God. Release your fire. Release your fire, God. Take us deeper. Mm. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Can we give a round of applause for the wonderful worship team? I got I to gotta say, uh, very weird for me to not be on the drums this morning. Jessica, you did phenomenal. Thank you. They got going and I was back there praying in the office. I'm like, man, this is just strange. <laughs> Cause I'm so used to coming up here out of breath. I almost didn't know what to do my, with myself for a few minutes. But uh, it, it was nice to finally just, not that I'm not worshiping when I'm on the drums list, <laughs> but to, uh, to just sit in the atmosphere in his presence with you all. I don't get to do that that much. But uh, thank you all for being here. Welcome to Family Church. No, that was absolutely just God awful. Thank you for coming to Family Church. I'm glad you're here. There we are. That's so much better. Y'all, we don't sleep in this house. I've been up since four o'clock in the morning, been here since about 4.45. If I'm awake, you're awake. Let's go. <laughs> uh, if it's your first time visiting here, I wanna welcome you here. Uh, I don't know if anybody warned you for what's about to come. I say that like it's a bad thing, but it's a really good thing. We, uh, we, don't, we don't have fluff here. We don't do entertainment. We love to just uh, have presence more than performance. And we, we just slowly walk through the word, at least when I'm teaching. I know my dad does it different, and he's got his way, but this is the way that God has, has given me to do it. Um, if, if you are offended by my hoodie right now, don't worry. There's more to come. And it's actually straight out of the Bible, so <laughs> it's coming. Uh, If you are not a believer and you are in here, I'm glad you are here. You do belong before you believe. You can join us in these holy conversations as we walk through God's reverent, sovereign word, which we cannot get enough of. It is, mm, he is the only thing that will satisfy if you, uh, I know we have a new family here that moved down from Michigan, not to come here, but they're, they're here, so I wanna welcome them personally. I spoke to them before, before we go, and so y'all give them a round of applause. When you're here, your family, it's not just Olive Garden. We are in the middle of a series called Contend. We are walking through the book, the letter of Jude. It's 25 verses. If you haven't read it before, it is probably not being really preached anywhere else in America right now because it challenges every uh, woke TikTok theology and cotton candy Christianity that you could imagine. 
Uh, if you're looking for something to spoon feed you that makes you feel good, unfortunately, you are not going to get that here. You're going to get what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. We are in, as Kelsey loves when I say it, episode eight. It's a series, so I'm calling it episodes. Sue me. <laughs> it's my wife. Y'all got a couch? I'm just kidding. Uh, to tag a title to this text today, straight out of the text, we're going to call it Snatched from the Fire. For the note takers, we're going to be in Jude 22 to 23, two verses. Hope you pack the lunch. Uh, we're almost done with this, y'all. It has been a lovely, wonderful journey. I have had so much fun just walking through this. Uh, what I have not had fun with is when you preach on fighting and then hell wants to fight against you. That part's not fun. So I'm sure you're all dealing with it too because we know what happens to the head flows to the body. And I know some of the things that some of you personally are going through. So uh, I wish I could apologize, but I will not because that is what comes with Christianity. Jesus told us that we will have trials and tribulations in this world, but to take heart, he has already overcome the world. So we know if you've been following with us from the beginning of this book, Jude calls himself a servant of Jesus and a brother of James. They're both brothers of Jesus. Neither one of them wanted to equate themselves or use their status to be known as Jesus's brother. Uh, not something that a lot of us could say because I can guarantee you about 99% of the room, if you grew up with Jesus as your older brother, you'd be like, yeah, that Jesus guy. You know, that was, that was my brother. We played football in the backyard. Somebody's like, that's not historically accurate. Uh, but if you've been following with us, you know that we've, we've, we've just completely torn apart this text. And, and I mean, I have approached this thing at every angle, hopefully feeding you with more Tupperware than Thanksgiving could have provided in any way, shape, or form for you. And I pray, you know, all of these messages are available free of charge on YouTube to go back and feast upon uh, but I'm having a blast. We're almost done. I'm excited for the rest of the year. Uh, I know this week on, Lauren, where are you at? I can't see. She was here earlier. Oh, oh her husband. Thursday, thank you. Uh, Thursday is the women's uh, fellowship. What time is that at? 5.30, 6.30. I'm so off. Samsonite. Um, <laughs> 630 for the women's fellowship. They still have women's Bible study every Tuesday in here at 10 a.m., I believe, right? Yes. yes. 1030? 10. 10. Oh, I'm deaf too. Um, 10 a.m. And then we also have the classic Christmas movie night is this Friday. Um, prayers every Saturday at 5 p.m. You're all welcome to that. You're all welcome to that. Unless you're preaching like witch, or preaching, unless you're praying or something in witchcraft, then I'll, I'll personally see you to the door because that's not welcome. Um, but, uh, and then next Sunday, if you want to have fun, uh, is our second annual ugly Christmas sweater party. Uh, I, I don't know why I call it a party, but we always have a party when we're in the house with Jesus. Uh, I, I'm hoping mine comes in. I ordered a new one, and then I saw that I think it's shipping from not in the United States. So I'm probably going to have to go to Marshall's <laughs> and get a different one. And the one I ordered will be here next week or next year. But uh, as we've walked through this, we've seen several things. We've seen that Jesus was the one that, with Moses, he led the people out of Exodus, and then eventually they all turned their backs on him. We're, we're learning about contending for the faith, fighting for the faith against false prophets that are all over the place nowadays. Uh, and so Jesus pulled these people out of Exodus. They eventually, they turned their backs on him. We learned about the angels that fell from heaven that became demons. They rejected their, their heavenly authority and now they wanna drag you down into eternal damnation with them because they were exiled from heaven. Uh, we learned about the example of Sodom and Gomorrah with sexual immorality and sexual sin that they were burned up in the fire signifying what will be the second death, the eternal fire for anyone that is still living in their sin and has not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So I urge you today, my heart is completely for the lost. If you haven't been here and you haven't heard me speak, uh, we do everything, I do everything I can to try to reach the lost. I do not mince words. I, I will not fluff your butt or fluff your pillow. I'm not going to pat your butt. We're going to tell you what you need to hear, and you can hate me now, and you can love me in eternity. Um, or you can hate me now and really hate me in eternity because you didn't listen. 
But uh, we're, we're learning about the false prophets. They, they have been chasing their own dreams for their own selfish gain. They defile the flesh. They engage in sexual immorality. They blaspheme all of the, the holy ones. We, we learned about Cain, the example of Cain, how he was the example of hidden sin and rejected God's word when God told him how to do it. And he, he didn't think that God actually meant what he said he meant. And then he was exiled as well. We learned about Balaam's error where it shifted from just personal sin into a uh, more communal sin where Balaam used his own status to lead others astray for his own profit, his own gain, because false prophets are also in it for the profits that you give them. And then we learned the climax of that and how Jude structures his letter. Every, you have to pay attention to everything in the Bible with words. I'm big on words and structure. Balaam should have came after Korah, but the climax of the illustration that Jude was making was that Korah's rebellion, uh, it showed that you, you took your hidden sin and then you went further into it and then you went into full-blown blown rebellion. And if you know uh, the book of Numbers where it is, uh, Korah led 250 people to rebel against Moses. Uh, you know, why are you in charge? Why can't we be in charge? Why did God pick you type of thing? Because nobody does that. And then uh, <laughs> Moses challenges them. And if you know your story, everyone involved with that and their, their wives and their children get swallowed up in the earth and die. They go down literally alive into the depths of the earth and die Children, the wives, everybody involved in their household because uh, men, you are in charge of leading your household. So if you're gonna live in sin, you're gonna lead your family in sin. So we see the false prophets lead everybody astray with no remorse. And they are reserved for judgment and they want to take you down. Now last week was the first week that we finally got to see how to contend. Can anybody that was here tell me what it was? Awful. Oh my Lord, I'm just kidding. Girl, building, praying, keeping, and waiting. Come on now. Let that thing be burned up inside your soul. I, I'm making it, I, I study this so much, so of course it's all up here. Uh, <laughs> but... Y'all know I have a very, very, very dry sense of humor. So, <laughs> good luck. Uh, so yeah, we learned how to contend for the faith. Building yourselves up in the faith. Praying in the Holy Spirit. That's not tongues in this context. Keeping yourself in the love of God. You cannot be, you cannot remove yourself from God's love, but like a parent, if you, when your kids do something that you don't like, you still love your kids, but you also want to beat them over the head with a shoe because they're not being obedient. That is what this is talking about. You, you don't get removed. God is still loving you, but you are, you are removing yourself from the comforts of your love and facing the consequences of his wrath and then waiting for the return of Jesus. So now after we have finally seen, after seven weeks, six weeks until we learned how to build ourselves up, now we see what to do with that. After we know who to watch out for, how to build ourselves up and what to do, now we go and we set out to help others. Before I read the text, let's pray one more time. Heavenly Father, Ancient of days. God, we thank you for the ability to even just meet in this room. We don't take it lightly to have this opportunity where many others across the sea where they can't even publicly meet you, where in China they just memorize one scripture at a time because if they get caught with it, they will be facing time in prison, in detainment camps. God, we, we know that across the world there are people that are being persecuted just for following you and being forced to try to deny Jesus as their Lord and Savior and being killed for the faith. But we know, God, mm, that one day all of this will end, all of this will be wiped away and we will have a heavenly body, a renewed body, and we'll be swept up and meet you in the clouds where we will have eternal glory with you, where we will worship you, where we will finally see you face to face. So God, I ask you, 
wreck this service. Get me out of the way. Holy Spirit, I am your vessel. Come and fill me. Let fire flow through my vocal cords and let your word not return void. God, speak, hijack the service, hijack the sermon, and lead us to where you want us to go. God, I pray. Widen the stakes, grow your kingdom, grow your church, God. Send the lost, bring them home. Bring them home. God, creating us a deeper love for your holy word, for your matchless word. And God, we ask you, cover us in your protection. Guide us, God, guide us, guide us. Thank you, Jesus. And in the mighty and in the majestic and in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, everybody said, amen, amen. Amen. Verse 22 And have mercy on those who doubt. Have mercy. Already, uh, if, if you struggle with wanting to fight everybody, you're already struggling with this text and having mercy. Uh, mercy is something that we so often want extended to us, but we don't really want to extend it to anyone else. We like to enjoy the fruits of Jesus' labor for us, and uh, sometimes we like to... Get on our high horse because, you know, God has already saved us and pulled us out of our past, and now we want to hold everybody else's past against us, against them, sorry. And so Jude is calling us through the Holy Spirit's inspired words to have mercy on those who doubt. It's okay to doubt. I know this is already wrecking some of y'all, but you need to understand that you have these new Christians, you have people that are genuinely searching for the truth, but they're also being, if you're following the text or you have walked through the Christian faith at all in your life for any period of time, especially when you just come, you've already got questions. It's already weird. What do you mean there's three in one? What is the Trinity? How do you explain that? What do you mean Jesus died on the cross and rose for me? And so we, there's so many questions that luckily, through years and years and years of studying, there's so many answers available to us. So we're supposed to have mercy on those who doubt because there's conflicting messages between uh, the pure doctrine of the gospel and those that was being taught by false prophets. So if you are a new Christian or you're, you're not firmly rooted in your faith, you haven't exactly built yourself up in the faith, it's easy to be misled because as I have constantly screamed at you, if you don't know the Bible, you're not gonna know when someone's teaching you something that is not in the Bible. That is the point of the, the, the reality that so many in America and across the world just have a biblical illiteracy for something that is handed down to us in blood not just from Jesus' sacrifice, but from those that came to give us English translations, from from the the scholars and the scribes overseas who work on translating this, and if they make one mistake, even if they're in the book of Revelation and they're all the way at the end, if they make a mistake, they start all the way over to make sure that it is copied down correctly, that we have the unadulterated, unaltered, true word of God. So Jude is saying, we already know some of these people will be led to doubt because it is confusing. You're going against everything, unless you grew up in the faith, and if you just came to Jesus later in your life, now you have to reprogram your brain from what Satan, who is the God, little g, of this world, has already programmed you through indoctrination and the education camps that we call schools now and the entertainment industry, and the music industry, and the movie industry, and books, and film, and everything else that they put in front of your face in order to mock our Lord and Savior, because we do not mock Buddha, we do not mock Muhammad, we only mock the true God, the living God, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. That's why they don't attack anyone else. They don't attack Islam. They only attack Christianity, because you only attack what is real. Nobody cares. Nobody's out here fighting Willy Wonka. So Jude says these people don't need to be slandered, they don't need to be criticized, they don't need to be critiqued in their baby faith. They don't need to be ridiculed for not knowing the answers because you might not have the answer either. 
Or at one point, you also did not have the answer. So he says they don't need to be torn down. They need encouragement. They need to be built up. You need to have mercy on them. Now, if you have been in the church or around the church culture, you know that there is a tendency in some circles to mock or berate the confused. This is where we get church hurt because church is full of people and hurt people hurt people. So you're not church hurt. You're, well, I guess actually the true term is church hurt because the church is not a building. We are the church. So technically church hurt is the right term. But we, we don't have a bad, uh, a bad dinner at Applebee's and we, you know, we may stop going to Applebee's, but we don't quit eating out anywhere else. I don't like Longhorn Steakhouse. I like Texas Roadhouse or Outback Steakhouse. Guess what I don't do? I don't quit going to those. I quit going to Longhorn. I go to somebody that actually knows how to cook a piece of meat. And by cook it, I mean you just slap the thing on the grill while it's still mooing and bring it to me while it's still bleeding. What do you mean, ew? Rare. Rare is the only way. Let it be almost cold in the middle. Do you want to eat a football? With ketchup? No, 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 no. Hold on. We're going to have a healing service. Who said with ketchup? You're going to throw me off track of the whole message with ketchup. That's why you're sitting by Mitch. You're only going to eat chicken nuggets and french fries being a grown adult. Come on. Ketchup? Not even a... If it's a good steak and it's done right, it don't need nothing. Nothing. Tyler, get your girl, man. She cook a steak the right way. Somebody help that man cook a steak. <laughs> so, let's get back to Jesus. Just about everybody in the Bible doubted God, okay? Apart from God himself and the Holy Spirit and Jesus, just about everybody doubted God. You can shout me down if you think that's wrong, but you look at Adam and Eve when the fall happened, they did not take God at his word. They listened to the word of the devil. They listened to the serpent, and they didn't believe God at his word. So then they caused sin. Cain and Abel, the same thing we already learned about. Cain did not listen to God. We look at Abraham and Sarah. God did not trust them to take them through Egypt. And so he starts walking around saying that Sarah is his sister. That's weird. You see Moses, who doubted God so much that God had to send Aaron in order to help him. People doubted God all throughout the Bible. You have uh, Elijah. You have John the Baptist who sent his disciples to Jesus saying, are you him or are you not? God is not afraid of your doubts. God is not afraid of your questions. Jesus' own family called him crazy until they saw that he truly was the Christ, the Messiah, the living son of God after the resurrection. Peter denied Jesus three times after walking along with him. They all doubted God at some point. And you're lying if you say that you haven't. The most famous one that we love to knock is who we call Doubting Thomas, who had to see the holes in Jesus' hands and feet. But Jesus says, blessed was he for seeing, but blessed are we who believe and don't see, because one day we will see. One, mm, whether you want to, every knee, mm, every knee will bow, and every tongue, I'm already feeling it. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess and you will bow in reverence or you will bow because you are being forced to worship the God that you should have already worshipped while you were here on earth. Time is running out. You're running out of time to do it now. So you can bend and bow down and worship or you can bend and bow down and wail and weep because you missed your chance to do so. And you're going to have a very long time to think about that and regret it. Hand claps. (laughs) I saw one commentary said that the Bible is like, not like, the Bible has a dump truck full of doubters and God never gave up on them. In Matthew 28, in Matthew 28, right before the Great Commission, In verse 16, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Hold on. This is after the resurrection. They've already seen him. He's about to charge them to go out. Next verse, verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. 
They've already seen him risen. They've already seen him transfigured and glorified. They're worshiping him, but some are still doubting him. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, verse 19. He said, once you've got it all figured out and you don't have any more doubts, go out and make disciples. Uh, once you have it all together and you're not questioning me on anything, go and make disciples. Once, once you've got uh, 17 years of Bible study under your belt and a master's of divinity or a bachelor's degree and everything, go and make Oh, no, he just said, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He said, go and do this, all of you, go and do this. You might still have questions, you might still have doubts, but still go. Why? Next verse. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He is with you in your doubts, he's with you in your assurance, and in the times that you still have questions, he's still there, and he might not give you the answers right away, but he is there to heal your doubts. He is there to bring you through the moments of confusion. He's not afraid of your questions. You go through and you see how he taught his disciples. He wasn't afraid of their questions. Sometimes he rebuked them for asking questions because they kept asking questions to things that they had already seen and done, but they weren't believing it yet because we still struggle with wanting to maintain control, but you're not going to be a Christian and have control, men. You've got to give up control. Also, feminist women, and I have nothing against women, but you've got to give up control. There is a structure to the way that things, God, to the way that God created things. He's the head of the household, and then it is your husband, and then it is you, and then the children. Now, if your husband's not taking initiative, stop tearing him down and start building him up. Speak life over him. Speak what you want him to start doing, not nagging him, not berating him. And maybe you've been doing it for 15 or 20 years, but start speaking differently to him. Start watching the tone. Men too, I'm guilty of this. Watch the tone that you speak to people with and start speaking life over your mans and start speaking what you want him to do. Not, I told you to take the trash out, but start speaking the man of God that you want him to be, what the word says that he is, so that in due time, God will lift him up, and you will have who you have always been looking for. God is with you through those moments, and in Mark chapter 9, and I'm not going to read all of it, there is a story, if you want to uh, go home and study it later, nine, Mark 9, 14 to 29. Famous story, there is a father who brings his son that is demonically possessed to be healed. Uh, Put verse 18 up, please. And whenever it seizes him, This is the father telling Jesus about the son. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. We would describe this nowadays as a seizure, not demonic possession, because we have lost the way that the Bible was written. A supernatural world view. We look at it through our natural world view. If we don't see it, we don't believe it, we struggle with it, and we get mad and have awkward moments with the Christians that start labeling things as what they are, demonic spirits. It's not that every single thing is a demonic spirit. Of course, there's still medical issues. But back in this time, in the Bible's time, you look at the things that Jesus healed, and it was all things that we would prescribe medicine for now. Because we don't think Messiah anymore. We just think medicine. Medicine is now our God. 
You have a headache, you're going to go take aspirin. You're not going to pray for an anointing to cast it out in Jesus' name. And maybe sometimes it is just a headache, or maybe sometimes God's trying to stretch your faith and see if you'll trust him to heal you. Because we have lost every writer in the Bible, every author of every book, of every letter, epistle, Everything. They all had a supernatural worldview. We don't have that anymore because through time, we have been perfect, desensitized. We have been re educated by the demonic spirits that strip us of the things that we should see, the things that we should feel, and we no longer believe in the spirits. We no longer believe in that. Listen, if you're gonna believe in God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, you gotta also believe in the third of angels that fell from heaven because they rejected God out of pride and they hate you because you're made in his image. So you, you've gotta realize just how much hell hates you. They are eternal. You are eternal. They know what their fate is. There is no changing their fate. So what they want to do is bring you down with them, down into hell, where you will suffer for eternity, for, uh, from eternal separation from God forever and ever and ever. You're going to wish you could die and that it would end, but it is not ever going to, and you are re going to regret every single moment of it. You've got to get back to a supernatural worldview. And if you need help with that, find some books, find something, just ask God to reveal it to you. Ask God to show you and guide you through his word because you should already be diving in this book more than you dive on Hulu or Netflix or watch the NFL or watch MLB or watch whatever shows there are on TV now. Watching everything under the sun, you should be putting a lot more time into the Holy Scriptures than you do watching a screen. Facebook reels are not going to ma uh, matter on judgment day. Right. What's going to matter is your actions. What's going to matter is your faith. Did you have faith in him or not? And yeah, you can believe in Jesus and get into heaven, but you can also be a pauper in eternity. Oh, that went right over y'all's heads. You store up your treasures for eternity. So all the actions that you do now by reading and praying and going out and making disciples and reaching the lost and serving in church and giving to the church and doing all of the things that Jesus commanded you to do, you're storing up eternal treasure. So instead of trying to buy a nice house in a gated community and trying to buy a third boat and trying to buy a second camper and trying to buy a bulldozer and trying to buy all this other stuff or build a bunker or the Cochrane compound, all of that stuff that doesn't exist, all of these things that you want to keep, yeah, I said that, and you want to keep buying all this stuff under the sun, none of it is going to matter. So store up your treasure in eternity and don't worry about the things that are temporary. All of your possessions here are temporary, so keep holding on to them for as long as you want, but realize all they're doing is weighing you down. Oh, and I love this. Uh, verse 18, back up, please. Next verse. I lied. That's not it either. <laughs> um, shoot. 20, sorry. We'll come back to 19. They brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, it immediately convulsed the boy. It seized him and he fell to the ground and rolled about. Do you know why? Because in James 2.19, it says, even the demons believe and they shudder, they tremble. So this demon, it saw the living son of God knowing who he was and immediately it fell down in fear because it knew just who it was facing. It knew just what was about to happen. It knew that it was about to be releasing the boy from its grip. It knew that Jesus was about to heal this boy from a lifetime of torment, from a lifetime of seizures. It knew this boy was about to be set free and it was afraid. And what's hilarious, not hilarious, what's depressing, I have a weird sense of humor. It's funny to me. Now you can go to 19. The disciples couldn't do this. Now this is after the disciples had already been given authority and Jesus calls them a faithless generation. Y'all think I'm offensive. Jesus just called them faithless to their face. Y'all would shoot me. If the shoe fits, 
And sometimes it's a little too tight because you've been wearing it too long and it's time to get the next size up because you're maturing. Oh, baby, where y'all at this morning? Because you're maturing and growing up. It's time to kick off the baby shoes and your little Christian onesie and start getting a little more faith. It's our time to start trusting God a little more and getting in the book and breathing the Holy Spirit in and breathing God's word out. It's time to let that word get in you like a fire shut up in your bones and move through the world with that godly confidence that you should already have. Oh, mm -hmm. he calls them faithless because failure to stand in effective spiritual warfare against demons and overcome their influence and their control is viewed by Jesus as a lack of faith and a spiritual weakness. Failure to stand, I'm glad I wrote it down. Failure to stand in effective spiritual warfare against demons and overcome their influence and their control is viewed by Jesus as a spiritual weakness and a lack of faith. There is no victory where there is a lack of dedication and reliance on Christ. You're already set up for failure when you fail to fully trust him. You are either all in or all out. There is no on the fence. There is none. Somebody, I could feel it in my spirit. Somebody right now is thinking about the lukewarm verse in Revelation that had nothing to do with being lukewarm in your Christianity. I've already preached this. That was about the hot springs that had to be pumped down through pipes in order to bring either hot water for healing or cool water for refreshing. But when it was lukewarm, it would make them sick. It had nothing to do. So you either need to be on fire for God or your Christianity needs to be different than what the church hurt people have experienced and it needs to be refreshing to them. But some of us have nothing. We're trying to be on the fence and not doing anything for Jesus. We just come in church and sit here and look pretty and make sure we got our fit looking right and make sure everything's nice and good and we brought our Bible. Make sure people think that we're taking notes and doing everything under the sun to look the part. But I've already said it. You can have all the hallmarks of holiness, but none of the holiness. Look at Judas. Followed Jesus, never called him Lord. All in or all out. And then the father tells Jesus the audacity of this man. He said, if you can do anything, have compassion and help us. And Jesus is like, if, bruh, (laughs) what do you mean if? He says, is it verse 20 or 21? All things are possible to one who believes. There is no if. Jesus is saying, I am the living son of God. I, if you have seen the father, you have seen me. There is no if. Oh, it's like Yoda. There is no do or do not. There is no try. There is no if. He said, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. And the man, next verse 24. Oh. I believe, help my unbelief, a doubter, help my unbelief. And Jesus immediately cast the demon out. He didn't shame him. He didn't say, I find your lack of faith disturbing. He did none of those things. He immediately, that was the worst James Earl Jones impression you have ever heard in your life. You know what he did? He worked with the faith that the father already had. And then he gave him a reason to have more. See, this is when the man says, I believe, help my unbelief. He is saying, I have faith, but if it's not enough, God, give me more. Some of you need to start praying, God, increase my faith. 
fortify my faith. Give me more faith. And he doesn't just come to you with a gift-wrapped box of faith saying, here you go, here's the next level of faith. He's probably going to bring you something to test you in it so you can have the wherewithal and the cojones to step out and get in that next spot of faith. You pray for patience, Jesus puts you in a traffic jam. He doesn't just give you patience. He gives you the opportunity to stretch your faith and grow. I don't get to go to the gym and just say, man, give me new muscles. Give me more muscles. No, I've got to go under there and get under a crushing weight and lift it and maybe get injured sometimes. But guess what? The more I stretch it, the more I tear the fibers, the more I get hurt, the bigger I grow. Y'all thought that was a gym analogy. Rewind it back. He said, I I have faith, but give me more. And in Luke 17, the apostles even said to Jesus, said to the Lord, increase our faith. And some of you, this is wrecking your theology because you have put on the fake face of zealous faith. You have put on the fake face of zealous faith zealous faith for pure doctrine, but you can't admit that sometimes you have questions too. And you have misunderstandings and you have doubts. You read where John the Baptist asked Jesus, are you him or not? And you, 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 you judge John the Baptist. How could you doubt him? You read Adam and Eve, oh, you were in the garden and you had everything under the sun. How could you doubt him? How could you lead the world astray? This is what humans do. We don't believe the truth. We have to see the truth in order to believe. But that goes against everything that we were supposed to do. We're supposed to just trust God. This entire life is an experiment to say, are you gonna do what he says to do or not? Are you going to get into heaven or not? It is an experiment for your entrance into eternity. So you either go God's way and get and get into heaven or you keep walking your way and go straight down the depths into hell. There's no middle ground. There's no purgatory. There's no paradise apart from the man who provided your very salvation. Somebody give Jesus a shout. So we put on this fake face and we don't want to see people think that we struggle with our faith at times. God, why aren't you answering this? God, why haven't you changed this? I see that you're blessing other people in my life, but why aren't you doing that in my life? Because you ain't mature enough for it yet. Because you haven't walked through what they've walked through. You're seeing the highlights of their Instagram post and think they've got it all together, but you don't see the 67 filters that they had to put on in order to get there. You don't see the family cussing each other on the way to the Christmas card. You just see the Christmas card. And then you think, wow, they've got it all together. No, (laughs) it just looked like they did for about five seconds. And nowadays with Photoshop, you don't even have to have everybody smiling at the same time. You can just clip it up until it looks perfect because we want to look perfect for everybody instead of admitting that we're all sinners. We've all fallen short. And but by the grace of God, will we do anything in this life? So then you have people around you. I am going way too slow. You have people around you that are too afraid to step up to you. Because they think that they're going to get ridiculed for asking questions. So now we have a bunch of weak Christians that are too afraid to grow in their faith. Because they don't want to step up to you because they don't feel safe enough to ask. And maybe you have the answer. Maybe you don't. But you got to be adult enough, mature enough. How are you cold? (laughs) You've got to be mature enough. The air's not even on, Mom. (laughs) hell's hot get used to this where was I this oh so they don't feel safe enough to ask you questions because they're afraid that you're going to brush them off and in uh humanity's arrogance will act like they're stupid for asking everybody knows that 
No, you could have just said, oh, I don't know. Let's go find out together. How hard is that to admit? Oh, wait, we don't want to admit that we have failures. We don't want to admit that we have faults. We don't want to admit that sometimes we don't know all the truth. You can spend 57 years studying that thing, and you still ain't going to know all of it. You can read it through once a day, and you're still not going to know all of it. I mean, you could go through this book front to cover and quote it like the creepy guy on Criminal Minds with a photographic memory, and you still won't know it. Apart from the revelation of the Holy Spirit, you need God to guide you. So next time you sit down to get in the book, start asking God, lead me through your word. Show me what you're speaking in this moment. And don't just take it at face value. Study it. Dig into it. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing. Mm, But it is the glory of kings to search it out. So you can't be too afraid to dive in and drown out what you thought you know because you're afraid of having your thinking questioned. You've got to let go of the pride of thinking you've already got things figured out, which is probably why people struggle with my teaching when I come up and I just walk through the word and it comes against their comfortable little toes. Surprise, surprise, squash, there goes all your feet. But it's worth it. Crushes my toes first before it ever comes foot to you on this platform. It's got to come through me to get to you. You've got to question things. You've got to search through things. That is how you grow. Don't be afraid of having your thinking challenged. That's how you grow. That's how you grow. That's how you search things out. You've got to remember that at one point in time, you still rejected Jesus until he found you. I don't care if you grew up in church. He found you. I don't care if you went to Sunday school every day of your life, you haven't smoked a joint, you haven't uh, touched a drop of alcohol or snorted anything uh, under the sun. You haven't done anything and hasn't sinned. It's not real until he makes it real for you. So people forget that and they forget that we are objects of mercy and thus we need to show mercy to others, especially those on the edges. Now, this is not the false prophets. This is not the ones that are so far gone that Jude shows us and tells us that their judgment is already set in stone. The point of that is that they're so hardened, they're never going to change their way. Jude is saying these are the ones that are trying to still seek. The ones trying to still figure all of this out. And these could even be the ones that are being misled by the false prophets, which is exactly why we cannot give them a soft gospel. We cannot give them a comfortable Christianity. God never said you will be comfortable. He called you to be consecrated. He called you to be holy. Do you think it was fun for all of the grown men to get circumcised in order to be set apart? Do you think it was fun in Leviticus when they had to follow law after law over 600 different laws in order to be set apart? No, but he didn't call you to fit in with the world. He called you to be in the world, but not of the world, to stand out, to be a light in the world. So you have to contend for the faith. You can't give them a soft gospel hoping that everyone's going to find salvation because the truth is the parable of the sower. 75% of people are going to reject it. So now we show them mercy. Verse 23, save others by snatching them. Snatching them out of the fire. Are there any firefighters in here? You know, when a building is on fire, they don't stand outside. They're like, hey, that's, that's dangerous. We need you to come out. No, they strap up, they man up, and they run into the fire, and they get them. If there's an object in the way, they chop it out of the way. They cut it out of the way. They set their safety aside in order to go after people that are near death, that are perishing in the fire, and they carry them out. They say, mm, where are y'all at this morning? And they snatch them out of that fire. They pull them from the pit. That is what we are called call 
called to do as Christians to get out into the world and find somebody that's already burning and pull them out and say, there's a better way and his name is Jesus Christ. You need to get out of the world and you need to set yourself apart. You need to find your faith in Jesus. (sighs) Snatching them out of the fire. These are not the ones from the previous verse that are doubting. These are the ones straight up playing with fire. Already burning by it. They've already started believing and engaging in the dumpster logic that is TikTok theology. These people that abuse grace and they follow those who are taking them by the hand and leading them straight into hell. And we're supposed to go snatch them out of the fire. We do not stand by and hope they don't get burned. We take action. We take action. We do something about it. We do something about it. Your child is running off of a cliff. You don't stand by and watch it happen. If you do, I hope you go to jail. If your kid's about to stick a fork in a light socket or an electrical socket, you don't sit by and say, well, they're going to learn today. No, you're going to stop them from doing it. There's no learning today with your eternal soul. You will learn. You will learn that all of this is true, whether you want to believe it or not. You will bow. You will say the name of Jesus You will worship him. Mm. So when Christianity is dying from bad doctrine and weak doctrine, we don't sit by and hope it doesn't go out. No, we fan the fire within us. We build ourselves up in the faith. We keep ourselves in the love of God. We keep praying in the Holy Spirit. We keep anxiously waiting for the return of Jesus Christ, all the while going forth, going into all the world, Mark 16, 15, Matthew 28, 19, going out there and doing something about it, making disciples, telling people about your faith, telling people about Jesus, snatching them from the fire like a brand of the fire going in there and pulling them out of the fire like somebody did to you. The world is already burning. So what are we going to do about it? See, uh, the ones that are doubting, for some people, you can be gentle with them. And lead them to Christ. But for others, sometimes you have to, when they're not paying attention, get down there and say, hey, wake up. You need to pay attention. You need to do something. You're not living correctly. The Bible says that the way that you're living is leading you into hell. So I'm here to tell you in love, in compassion, that you need to change how you are living. Because if you don't, you're going to spend eternity apart from God. And I don't want that for you. I don't want it for anybody. I don't care how much you don't like them. You hate your boss? Guess what? Pray for him. You hate your narcissistic ex? Pray for them. You hate your narcissistic current person? Pray for them. Bible says pray for your enemies. That wasn't a suggestion. That is a commandment. But we all like to pick apart the Bible and pick and choose which ones we want to believe. And surely Jesus couldn't mean the people that are dragging me through the mud. Nope, guess what? He did. That's why when they were nailing him to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. They don't. So they're shaming you because they're so full of evil and you are full of the light of God. You are a burning flame, a candle, and they want to blow you out because they are full of darkness, but they don't know what they are doing. So you can keep getting mad at them and being upset at the situation or realize that it is a symptom of sin that you need to pray against, you need to take captive, you need to cast it down and plead the blood blood of Jesus over them and break out that anointing oil and start speaking life over them, start speaking them into the hands of God. That's why some people need the cold, hard truth. 
Jude, in this same passage and earlier in Jude, is alluding to Zechariah 3, 2 and Amos 4, 11 to 12. One was with Joshua the high priest that Satan was accusing because all he wants to do is accuse you before the Lord. And God himself said, take off his filthy rags. I forgive him of my sin. And they clothe him in righteousness. And in the same thing in Amos, they were saved from one situation in here, but they did not fully return to God. The point that Jude was showing that it is only possible for people in peril to escape punishment by repentance. It is only possible for people to escape the peril and punishment by repentance. Repentance is not grieving over the consequences of your actions. That's what Ahab did. He got mad and upset that he got caught. That's not repentance. That's worldly grief. Repentance is godly grief. Realizing I was doing this, but I'm turning my back on it, and I am going the other way. I am moving forward with Jesus Christ, and I am not going to do what I have been doing. I am moving forward. I'm leaving the past behind. Save others by snatching them out of the fire to others. Show mercy with fear to others mercy with fear these are the ones fully involved with false doctrine so now you have to have a different approach with your mercy and with your compassion you have to show caution with your compassion To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. We have to group these two together in order to break it down. The clothing is showing like leprosy, which was a disease that even got on their clothes and it could contaminate them if you touched the clothes. These people are contaminating you with their polluting behavior. You have to show mercy with fear. You have to fear being contaminated by them. Uh, In 2 John uh, 10 and 11, he literally says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, if they're not bringing this teaching out of the Bible, if they are a false prophet, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. Let me, let me, because that just shatters your, you know, I want to make everybody happy thing. If anyone comes to you and they're not bringing you the pure gospel, do not receive them in your house or give them anything. Do not greet them. For whoever greets him takes Part in his wicked ways. There's all kinds of apostles, and instead of testing them to see if their spirit is true, we keep tithing to them so they can get another Ferrari, another Rolex, and a whole bunch of expensive shoes and make the pastor's wife TikToks that show, oh, I got my makeup done in 15 minutes, praise God. No, have nothing to do with them. Have nothing to do with them. If they're twisting the gospel, have nothing to do with them. Leave them alone. Don't hang out with them. Don't reach out to them. Do not talk to them. This is wrecking y'all's thinking. Get away from them. Why? Because by you getting close to them, you are in danger of being contaminated by them. Don't get around these people. Now, on one hand, yes, there is no one so irredeemably bad that God's forgiveness cannot cover their sins. This is not that situation. The problem is, yes, God can forgive everyone and anyone. He can. He has the power. The problem is some people want to stay in their sin. They have no interest No heart, no hope. They want nothing to do with God. They know everything about God, and they still choose to reject him. And not just reject him, they love Satan. 
They hate God. They love Satan. For whatever stupid reason, they think that life's going to be real good on the other side of the grave. No. Wrong. But they don't want anything to do with God. So instead of pitying them to the point that you want to talk to them and reach out to them and think, well, maybe I can get these people and bring them in the church. Maybe you can. But maybe instead of that, you need to focus on taking it out of your hands and putting them into God's hands and praying over them so that you are not uh, contaminated by them and fall into their old ways. This is why you see drug addicts when they come out and they think, oh, I went to rehab and I went to prison for eight years. The first thing I want to do is go hang out with my old friends. You're an idiot. I mean that in the most loving way possible because I've seen it happen numerous times. Oh, I'm clean. I'm going to go hang out with all these people that still do the crap that I just got rid of doing. And what happens two months later? Boom, they're doing it again. They look like Skeletor running around and think nobody notices that they're still doing what they said they got rid of. Why? Because they went back to these people thinking that they could bring them out of it when they weren't mature enough in order to do so. Sometimes you're just not ready for that. And I know for some people, you want to save your friends. Of course we do. But sometimes all you're called to do is pray for them. Sometimes all you're called to do is plant the seed. But someone else is the one that's going to water the seed. And someone else is the other one that's going to pray over that seed. And then someone comes along further in the future that tills the ground for that seed and brings the fruit of that over them. So don't worry about trying to do it all by yourself and step out. Put them into God's hands. Or, like the Word of God says, pray them into the hands of Satan so that their flesh is crushed and their soul will be saved for eternity. Yes, that's the thing. Study the Bible. You can pray them into the hands of Satan so that they will be crushed in this earthly body. But their heavenly one, their eternal soul will be saved. Which one matters more? A lifetime of persecution or an eternity of punishment? Y'all, we, we have got to stop compromising on the gospel, to stop compromising on Christianity, especially for corrupt people thinking that we can lower God's standards and say, yeah, he still loves you. He's okay with that. No, the minute you start to squash the Holy Spirit, the minute you start to twist God's standards and think just because he loves them that he will accept everything about them, no, he doesn't like their sin. His word is unchanging. It has not changed. It will never change. He is an unchanging God. His word stands true forever. Not one dot, not one tittle will pass. So you can't lower the standards. The minute you start lowering the standards, you start corrupting yourself. And then they will lead you astray. So you show them compassion. Mixed with fear. Hating the garment even stained by the flesh. Because you need to be afraid of being defiled by them. And you need to be afraid of God's righteous, holy judgment that is probably already closing in on them. And they have led many astray to their little movement or their little church or their little group or Bible study, and they lead people apart. But God is a holy judge. He is an impartial judge, and he will not be mocked. Stained. The garment stained by the flesh. Jude is showing their clothes. They're so corrupt that they literally smell like rotting flesh. The sin that covers them, the sin that clothes them is so permeating their very being that it is a disgusting smell. 
And it's like rotting flesh. And they're clothed in a garment that stains them. But we, believers, are clothed in the righteousness of God. We have been made spotless by the blood of Jesus. There is nothing that washes away your sins apart from the blood of the Lamb who made you white as snow. Last verse. Not really. We're almost there. Second Corinthians. Chapter 2. Verse 14 and 15. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing them. Who are perishing. I didn't give them 16, but I'll read it. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. He picked the imagery of a Roman procession, like a parade, where the uh, victorious general would parade with his victorious soldiers through a city, also showing off the captives that were taken in battle. Now, while they did this, they burned spices and incense. So as they went through the city parading around with the victorious people and those taken captive, they burnt spices. For those that were victorious, Christ, the Christians, it is an aroma representing victory. It is an aroma representing life. To those who were captive, to those that are perishing, it is an aroma of death. It is the same fragrance. But when you are on the losing side, it smells different. Now, the message of Christ is the fragrance that brings life to some and death to others. It doesn't mean that it's representing death. It means that there are people that reject Jesus, and in their rejection, that brings their death. So my question for you all today... What do you smell like? What do you smell like? Are you walking through this life with a fragrance that represents the life of Jesus? Do you even have a smell? Or is your Christianity so weak and watery and surface level that nobody can tell that you even follow God? Welcome to family church. Or is your Christianity so bitter and broken that it smells like death to everyone around you? And that's why you can't lead anyone to Christ because why in the heck would they want to have anything to do with someone who just looks angry and bitter and resentful and full of rejection and remorse and regret and depression and have all of those things spewing out of them instead of bringing life into the world, instead of being a light into the world? In Mark 2, 17, Jesus said that he, the, the healthy don't need a doctor. The sick do. He didn't call the righteous. He came for the sinners. You guys can come. In the 1300s, There was a disease that ravaged Europe and killed around 50 million people, the Black Plague. And you've probably seen the pictures of these doctors. There's one on my jacket, the big beak thing that they wore. As they walked through the death and decay that was all around them where they were, They wore this big mask that was filled with spices so that they could avoid the aroma of death. So they wouldn't smell the death. Now, they also believed at the time 
that the air was polluted. So they wore the mask to avoid the aroma of death and also to protect them from tainted air that they believed carried the disease. To put it differently, they were clothed in something that protected them from death. You are clothed in something that protects you from death. Eternal life did not start, does not start when you die. Eternal life for you started when you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and chose to follow him. Not to ask him into your heart, that's not in the Bible at all. And I'm probably guilty of using that same phrase myself. So if I am, I apologize. But confessing, believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth that he is not just your savior because everybody wants to avoid hell, mostly. It ain't a party, okay? I know y'all like the shout out Highway to Hell with ACDC who's suddenly doing another tour. I guess they're gonna come out in their walkers. <laughs> Bro, they gotta be like 90 years old now at this point. Come on. Why do y'all get like that? Uh, <laughs> we all get old. I don't know why people get upset when I say like old people or something like that. Like we all get old. And to be honest with you, uh, let me just get real with you from my heart. This is how I view it. All of you older generation, uh, as blunt as I can put it, that's closer to the grave. You should be happy. You should be rejoicing. I don't know why the older generation so often tends to get upset. You are closer to glory than anyone else in this room. So the younger people should be a little bit more jealous, in a holy way, of your, uh, of your closeness to God. So walk through this life that you have left with joy. Not jealousy and not bitterness about the younger generation. But realizing that you are about to see Jesus before we get to see Jesus. So I hope when you get there, you throw a party before we get there. And when we all come and we can all feast together with you and you get to say, hey, I beat you here. And we get to say, yeah, but we got to keep handing off the baton. So they wore this mask in order to avoid the aroma of death and to clothe themselves in something that protected them from death. Now, like the doctors of that day, everybody in this room walks through a world that is filled with death and decay and deception falling apart, on fire, burning. I don't care that Donald Trump is about to get in office. That's not really going to turn everything around. He is not the Messiah. But we walk through a broken and a dying world, and we are called to be a light for Christ Now, sometimes there's people around you that want to connect to you because your light is keeping back their darkness. But everybody hear me, please pay attention. At some point, you've got to pick up your own candle. You have to burn your own flame. You can't hug someone else who's on fire and expect to get to heaven. Acts 19, the sons of Sceva that tried to cast the demon out from the Jesus whom Paul proclaimed. They tried to just claim Jesus through someone else. They did not have a personal relationship with him. Your own personal Jesus is not just a catchy tune. It's something you should be doing. Having Jesus personally. Now, for a time, it's okay that you connected to someone who maybe was more mature than you that helped you walk along and helped your light grow. But it's time to light your candle like we're going to have in a couple weeks with the, uh, the, the candlelight service and lighting each other's flames. 
It's time to hold your own candle. It's time to be a light for Christ. And no one is supposed to put it under a bucket and hide it. You're either burning or you're not. If you're not going to burn, then blow it out. Get out of the room and make way for people that actually want to enjoy Jesus Christ. John 1, 5 says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The selling point for Christianity is this. It's hard, it's harsh. We're mocked, we're lied about, we're slandered, we're ridiculed, we're persecuted, we're tortured, we're murdered, we're beaten, we're destroyed. We're not abandoned. We are anointed. We are chosen. We are risen. We are the remnant of God. We are either building up or falling away. There is no in between. So God chose you. It's time to build yourself up in the faith and contend for the faith. Get your light and let it shine. Because the darkness does not overcome you. As you build your faith, as you build yourself up in your faith, as you pray in the Holy Spirit, as you keep yourself in the love of God, and as you wait for the return of Jesus, I have one final verse for you to remember as you do so. 1 Peter 2.12. Whenever they put it on the screen. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. You walk among the pagans. You live among the pagans. You walk among death. You walk among decay. I don't care if you're retired and your entire existence is confined to one small area. There's still someone you know that you can reach. I don't care if you're mute and you need to have someone. You have to read these on captions. You have a platform with Facebook. You have a platform with TikTok. There's high schoolers in here. There's middle schoolers in here. You have a bigger platform than the disciples, than the the apostles than any writer of the Bible ever had at your very fingertips and it is your job to share the gospel the last thing you want to do is be standing in line on judgment day and looking over at your friends and they are grieving because you didn't tell them about Jesus because you were ashamed of Jesus deny him before men and he will deny your entry into heaven There is no shame in Jesus. He hung naked on a cross, was beaten before he got there, beaten so badly you couldn't tell if he was a man or a woman. That's how bad it was. His final words were spoken when they stuck the the sponge in the sour wine, in the vinegar. That sponge was used as toilet paper by the Roman soldiers. So the final words... that our Savior spoke over us was filled with the taste of human excrement. And we're scared to tell people about him. Like, it's embarrassing to tell people I'm a Christian. It's embarrassing to tell people about Jesus. You don't even realize what he did for you. I mean, he had this planned before eternity. He could have just stopped creation, could have changed creation into something different. But he still made it knowing that we would still sin, knowing that you would look at Pornhub tonight after hearing this sermon, knowing that you're still going to pick up the bottle because you're still struggling with your sin, knowing that you're going to pass out and possibly overdose from the needle hanging out of your arm and hopefully see another day, knowing that you're going to crush up the Oxycontin and still snort it and hope that it crushes the feelings inside of you because you haven't filled it with the Holy Spirit. You're trying to fill it with something that numbs the pain. 
And the only thing, the only person that numbs the pain is him. It's the only thing that's ever going to satisfy you. And you've got to get that grip. He left eternity. You can't even fathom what that looks like to come down and reject the heavenly body and become fully man and experience every single thing, every temptation. You think his knees didn't hurt when the weather changed? You think his back didn't hurt? You think he didn't have a cold or the flu? You think he didn't struggle with things? He went through everything, every temptation that we face in order to give us the pathway to eternal glory, to restore our relationship with him, to reconcile us back to him. So the best way that I can say and the nicest way that I can put it is we need to quit putting the sponge back in his mouth and putting, put, taking a crap on the cross and making a mockery of it and sending him back there every single time hypo, or, uh, symbolically because we want to abuse grace instead of getting on our face and saying, God, I'm tired of struggling with this. I'm tired of struggling with my sin. Cut this out of me and make me holy. Make my life an altar. God, rip everything out. I don't care if it hurts. I don't care if it breaks me. This is not just the ministry. Your life is a ministry and ministry is others being blessed by the oil that was made from what crushed you. So as you go through the rest of this week, remember that you walk among the pagans. You walk among death, carrying the fragrance, the aroma of the gospel of Jesus Christ that brings life and live in such a godly way. That doesn't mean you're not still going to struggle because you will. Don't beat yourself up about it. The devil will have a good enough time doing that. He's the only one doing it. God's not. When you struggle, God is not like, you big dummy, stop. But realize that you need to live in such a holy way that people, just by watching your character, will be led to Christ. You are a living sacrifice. Your life is a walking, living ministry. Let your light shine. Quit hiding it. Don't expect to hide it and still get into heaven. Let's pray. If everybody can stand, please. They're, they're going to worship. They're going to worship one more time. If you need prayer, and we all do, <laughs> the altar is open. There is no judgment to come and ask for prayer. No matter what you need, there's no request too great or too small. If you're watching this online, drop it in the comments. If you're on our app, under the connect tab in the bottom right, I just added a button where you can submit your prayer request straight from the app. And Kelsey and I, at least us, there's others, but just us, we at least every week go through every single one in the box that's out front in the foyer and we pray over them and we reach out to whoever left their emails to check on you. You are being prayed for. You are being interceded for. And what's even better than us doing it is the Bible says Jesus does it for you too. So if you need prayer, come to the altar.
Don't wait for the invitation. The invitation is now. If you're struggling with sin and you want to get free, come down. We will pray for you. Confess it to the Lord. Don't be ashamed. Don't wait. Don't worry about what somebody else is thinking. Don't worry about what your mother or your sister or your brother or your father or your grandma or your friends or whoever else thinks. Push them out of the way and come to the altar if you need prayer. It's open. It's open. It's open. There's no time to wait. If you... If you feel the crush of the conviction of your sins and you need Jesus, come. Come down, come here, and come home. Home is in heaven. That's why you feel homesick because you're not there yet. So come home, child. Brother, sister, whatever you're feeling, whatever you're facing, God forgives you. God will love you. He loves you now. He wants to set you free, but you've got to come. You've got to confess your sins. Believe in your heart for Jesus, and he will bring you home. He will deliver you from it. Yes, you will still struggle, but he will wipe away every tear And he will bring you from it. He will bring you out of it in your life. Everything that you faced up until this point will be part of your testimony so that you will share it with someone else. There's nothing that you faced or that was too bad, too broken, too messy that he can't clean up. And all of it, all of it, all of it, all of it was for a reason. Heavenly Father, God, I ask you. Forgive us. Forgive us all for our apathy, for our laziness, for trying to do things in our own way for putting idols before you, for putting ourselves before you, propping up ourselves through our pride. Cut it all down, cut it all away. Get us completely out of the way. Jesus, decrease us and increase yourself in our lives. God, I pray your saints be awakened. I pray fire falls in this place. I pray St. Augustine comes home to you. It doesn't need to be in this house, but as long as they're going to a biblical house, a gathering of saints that is biblically based and accurate and fully seeking you with their hearts, God, fill every church in this very town. And God, if they're preaching something false, if they're preaching something twisted, if they're preaching a mockery of the gospel in any way, shape, or form, if their motives are not correct, lead them first to repentance and shut the doors. Open the doors that need to be opened and close the doors that need to be closed. And God, I ask you, restore to us the reverence for your holy word, for your scriptures, for your matchless word that doesn't change, that brings light into the world, that tells us how to live, that tells us who you are, that guides us in order so that we will be made righteous and meet you in glory. Let it not just be a book that sits on the floorboard and collects dust, but let us build us up and send us out. Awaken your saints, God. Awaken your saints, God. Firefall. Amen, amen. Let's worship, let's worship, let's worship. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. 
Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.